He chose that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I guess this is all we're gonna get, but I guess 19 out of 33 ain't so bad. The stragglers come in. You know? What? The stragglers usually come in like five, ten minutes. Mm, true. All right, that'll, that'll help. But <clears throat> okay. So uh, today we're going to wrap up a uh, discussion of. Uh, Higher order linear equations. Um, but first, a little complex number lesson. Um, so, stemming from certain ODEs that you might get um, of higher order. So, you have an ODE like this where you have a n third of a y um, minus some constant, I'll just call it q, uh, like in the second order case, uh, times y equal to zero, then um, what is the character, characteristic equation for an ODE like that? Would it be Rn? Mm -hmm. Minus Q? Yeah, Rn minus Q is equal to zero. So in other words, your task is to solve the equation R to the N um, is equal to Q. Uh, now, you might... Normally, you would think, oh, you just take the nth root, um, and if it's a even power, then you might do plus or then you would do plus or minus, and that's it. But no, because you need n roots altogether to express the general solution of this differential equation. I uh, came across this on uh, Monday, where in this case, in that case, uh, um, n was equal to six and q was just equal to one. But I want to be a little more general uh, than that. Um, so. Um, so for n roots uh, in, in general, to get the distinct um, n roots, um, I'm going to let q be any complex number. Um, now, I don't really need to be that general, but it'll make things easier later on. Because in any problems you would have, q would either be a positive or negative real number. But because we need positive or negative, uh, it'd be easy to describe what's going on this way. Um, so we have um, real imaginary parts, but this is not the most advantageous way to express a complex number um, in this case. Um, I'm actually going to use um, uh, polar coordinates. Now, I already used R, so to prevent confusion, I can use a different letter. Um, rho e to the i theta. Um, so rho and theta are the polar coordinates so you guys use a little cal for you, it never hurts, of uh, a point alpha of theta because in the complex plane this is your real axis, the x-axis, y-axis is your imaginary axis and you have your complex number whatever it is, alpha beta somewhere out here. So the real part is your x coordinate. Your imaginary part serves as your y coordinate. Um, and polar coordinates, the magnitude is rho. And then the angle that it makes would be, in this case, positive real axis is theta. Um, Who remembers how to get uh, this coordinate rho in terms of uh, alpha and beta? The distance. That's the uh, magnitude of the of both of them. Yes, so and mean, that is given by the alpha squared plus beta squared, like the root of that. Yeah, so the square root of alpha squared plus beta squared. Um, and then the angle tangent of theta is uh, beta over alpha. Um, so then um, what you can do is, so that's how you get this representation. Um, but now we want the roots. So r is equal to, so the roots that we want are equal to the um, this number, rho e to the i theta, raised to the 
1 over n power, but we want to express all the solutions of that, not just the one that we customarily get. Now, in actual problems, the only values you would ever encounter for theta are 0 if uh, q is positive and uh, pi if um, q is negative. But this will, this will cover everything. Um, so if we just go ahead and raise this whole expression to 1 over n power, rho is a um, non-negative real number. So you just take the ordinary and through the vat. And what happens with this part, e to, uh, theta? When you're raising that to the 1 over n, you get e to the what? Remember your laws of exponents. I theta over n. Yeah, I theta over n. Um, which can then be expressed as Uh, in terms of trig functions, what would that be? Cosine theta over n plus what? Yeah, I sine theta over n. Um, now we're almost there, but the drawback of this is it's still only one root and we need n of them. Um, so for that, um, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit in a way that doesn't actually change its value. Um, all right, this part stays the same. Because um, I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to change this before. I raise it to the 1 over n power because cosine and sine are 2 pi periodic. So I can add any integer multiple of 2 pi to this angle, and the value is not going to change. Um, so now if I raise this to the 1 over n power, I can get all the roots. magnitude, and then we have cosine, and we have theta plus 2j pi all over n plus i sine theta plus 2j pi all over n. Okay. Um, <coughs> now, bless you, uh, every, you can, and you just need to use enough values of j to get all the distinct points in the complex plane. So it's enough to use j is equal to 0, 1, 2, up to uh, n minus 1, for instance. So that would give you uh, n uh, distinct roots. And as I mentioned in the example I did on Monday, so for, for example, if uh, q is a, uh, a positive real number, and let's suppose um, Let's suppose that this um, nth root of q is somewhere here. Um, then, um, okay, I'll, I'll use an uh, example n is equal to uh, 6. Okay, so then you just go around the circle in steps of 2 pi over 6, or whatever exponent you have. Um, so this would be one root right here. Here's another three. Uh, so, so this is one root right here, just plain old n root uh, six root of q, and then so one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're all spaced in this example pi over three apart, or in general two pi over n. Um, so by getting the roots in this manner, you can be sure to have the. Um, uh, the general solution, um, because uh, in an n-fold equation, you have to have n linearly independent functions to express everything and satisfy all your initial conditions. Any questions about this? Uh, so something that can come up on a um, like a homework problem or possibly a test problem. Okay. Um, so now. 
Um, I'm going to give a rundown of how do we proceed, with, what's the whole procedure for um, solving n for linear equations, whether they be homogeneous or not. So this is, we'll have um, all the directions in one place, basically. form and derivative. Make sure it's in this form where there's no coefficient in front. If not, divide by it. Um, I'm not going to assume in what I give here that, well, actually, yeah, I will assume they're constant. Uh, I'll talk about non-constant at the end. So P1, P2, Assume we have some function g of t on the right side that uh, may or may not be zero. Okay. Um, with initial conditions, y of t naught is y naught, y prime of t naught is y naught prime, and so on. And you have n voter problem n. Initial condition starting from y, y prime, all the way down to the n minus first derivative. Okay. Um, so, first thing, uh, and we'll reiterate only if they are constants. Characteristic equation, just like in the second order case, so you have r to the n plus p1 r to the n minus 1, so increasing indices of p's, decreasing powers of r, um, and you have to get the roots, which I'll refer to as r1, r2, up to rn. Um, using whatever approach suits that problem. And I just want to indicate a few right here that will definitely be helpful. One is uh, factoring by grouping, at least in the, um, especially in the cubic case, um, is, is where that's helpful because you can look at pairs of terms. Um, another is uh, what I just did over there. Uh, finding the n distinct roots of a number, uh, including complex roots. Um, and another, I mentioned this on uh, Monday, uh, Pascal's triangle, that certain coefficients uh, indicate that the uh, polynomial is a, uh, uh, for instance, uh, r plus 1 or r minus 1 uh, raised to a power. So the triangle starts at 1. 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, and so on. Um, so those are uh, certain things to keep in mind. Or um, if it doesn't fall into these categories, maybe something where um, you uh, can go ahead and factor something out right off the bat. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, maybe factoring out uh, r to some power, so you have 0 as a repeated root. And then what's left over is, is of a low enough degree, maybe a quadratic, that you can go ahead um, and factor. Um, so uh, the intent is not to give something that is some extreme algebraic nightmare, or that you'd have to run to a calculator for just to get uh, just to get the um, uh, roots. Okay, um, so that's first thing: get those roots. Um, second, um, homogeneous solution. Whether the original problem is homogeneous or not, you still need this part anyway. Um, so you have constant y1 plus constant y2 and so forth. 
um, where y1, y2, and et cetera are still obtained essentially in the same way as um, in the um, second order case, except now because you have a higher degree, you have more possibilities for um, repeated roots. So real roots still gives you e to the rt. Complex roots still gives you e to the alpha t cosine beta t, um, e to the alpha t sine beta t, where alpha and beta are the real imaginary parts uh, of those roots. And then the, the most important new wrinkle for higher order equations, like I said, more possibilities for repeated roots. Um, so if a root occurs k times, then you multiply these solutions that you get from your real and complex roots, multiply, by t to the 0, t to the 1, t squared, and so forth, up to t to the k minus 1. So for example, if uh, the root uh, 4 um, appears 5 times in your factorization, you're going to have uh, e to the 4t, t e to the 4t, t squared e to the 4t, t cubed e to the 4t, and t to the 4th e to the 4t. Um, and the thing that's particularly new for um, higher order problems that never came up in second order, this can also happen with complex roots. You can have complex roots repeat. Um, so if uh, 2 plus 3i um, appears um, twice as a root, therefore it's conjugate, 2 minus 3i also appears two times as a root. You're going to have these solutions um, with um, alpha equal 2 and beta equal 3, and then these again multiplied by t. Um, and as for these kind of solutions that you can get, um, this is all highlighted on um, page 75 of the notes describes all of these um, uh, situations. <clears throat> Um, and then, um, if you have a non-zero uh, right-hand side, um, then compute the Rothschildian of your solutions, y2 up to yn, which is this n by n determinant with your solutions across the top row. Then first derivatives, second derivatives, all the way down to n minus first derivatives in the last row, whatever n might be. Okay. Um, and then um, hmm. okay. Only if you're going to use variation of parameters. So that's my 3a here. Um, and then your solution, your particular solution. Um, okay. You need to amend your notes. So. Those of you watching at home or wherever you are, um, I'll call it y sub h because I have before the uh, homogeneous uh, solution distinguished from the particular solution y p of t and then the general solution y of t uh, coming at the end. All right. All right. So this has this form w1 y1 plus w2. 
y2, and so forth, all the way up to wn, yn. Um, where each of these variable parameters is the integral of, you have your uh, Ronskian in the denominator. And your numerator is you take this matrix and you put it down here, except you replace one column, column i, whatever that might be, with a column that is all zeros and g of t at the bottom. Okay. And then you compute, and the, 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 as indicated by the vertical bars, you take the determinant, so in both these cases, that's what I mean here. Um, to get your integrands, and then you go ahead and evaluate those integrals, and be sure to simplify as much as you can. Um, and then, so that's option one. Option two, you can always apply the method of undetermined coefficients that works exactly the same way as the second order case. Finding the form of y, p, and t. It's just, again, more situations can, can come up because you have more possibilities uh, for repeated roots. And once you have that all finished, then you put your homogeneous and particular solutions uh, together. Um, and in your homogeneous solution, after you put them together, Find your constants, if required to do so by the problem, um, using the initial conditions. So when you have everything in one place in your notes, where for an n folder equation, homogeneous or not, this is what you do. Um, I should mention on the uh, final, there will be at least a few cases where I say, I give you an initial value problem like any of these, but I want you to solve it using a certain approach. Um, like, for instance, next week we do Laplace transforms. Some of those problems can be solved using these kind of methods, but I want to make sure you know Laplace transforms. So be mindful of that if a method is uh, specified. Okay. Um, so this is what you should refer to, one thing you should refer to. Um, uh, when you solve these equations, or preparing to do so on the uh, final. Okay. Now, during the rest of the time, oh, attendance. Um, I started an example uh, last time, but didn't finish. So I want to finish that one, and also um, do some more. Set that's on this chapter um, counts for more points, therefore, a larger part of your grade. Um, okay, so you really can think of it as a few problem sets, just uh, express this one. Um, the example that has continued from before um, the problem is why triple prime. Which can also be written as y three superscript of three in parentheses. You might want to do that to make sure there's no confusion. Um, plus y prime is equal to one, and the homogeneous solution that was found before is constant plus um, constant e to the t plus constant t e to the t because of you know root of zero, and then two roots that were equal to one. Um, and uh, where left off last time is finding the w's from the uh, particular solution over there. Um, so, so the first one, you have, uh, so these determinants um, 
were actually computed. So it was um, e to the 2t up top. And then the Rothschild of these solutions was also e to the 2t. And like I've said before, there tends to be a lot of simplification in these integrals, thankfully. Um, so you just get t um, in that case. Um, and then for w2, um, the determinants of a numerator in the numerator that was computed last time would have to be minus t minus no, minus t e to the t minus e to the t over e to the 2t. Again, some simplifying the uh, e to the t um, up top cancels if one of the e to the t's down below. Uh, pull out the minus so you get t plus 1 e to the minus t to have everything um, upstairs. Okay. Um, how would you have to integrate that? Yeah. Um, and uh, one thing I'll point out uh, with doing something like this, when because yes, yeah, because of the t that you know you have to do it by parts, and we have this constant. It's tempting to um, just take the, the like distribute and take the constant term, so e minus t, put out to the side, and you can just integrate that right away. But um, it's actually nicer to keep it all together. Um, so if we go through the motions of integration by parts. What is your u in this case? Yeah, t plus 1. Um, so whatever polynomial of t, often it's just a power of t, so that should be your u because you can differentiate that, keep doing so until it goes away. So therefore, your du is just dt. Um, and then the rest of it, e to the minus t, is your db, so what's your b? Minus. Divide by the coefficient of t. So minus e to the minus t. Okay. Um, so then we go ahead and apply the integration by parts formula. So you have t plus 1 times minus e to the minus t minus the integral of v du. So that's going to be minus minus plus e to the minus t dt. And now that you can just go ahead and uh, um, integrate directly. So that's going to give you, um, just like what happened over here, minus e to the minus t. So after you um, expand this and condense as much as you can, um, Determinant computed last time for the numerator was uh, um, just e to the t. It's e to the 2t or Rothschild down below. So it simplifies to e to the minus t. So you get minus e uh, to the minus t. Um, now, if I keep in mind that here is we have y1, which is 1. This is your y2. And this is your y3. So that's what we'll take into Count when computing all these determinants uh, last time. 
now we can um, put everything together. So who can tell me? Um, go ahead and box the right things here. Okay. Um, what is the particular solution? Using the form that's written on the other board. Oh, hold on, hold on. Speaking of other board. Sorry to everyone who's watching. As you can see, you kind of missed a few things. So, pause and write and curse at me and do whatever you need to do. Um, okay, all right. Now go ahead. T. Mm -hmm. And I'll put an implied one in here uh, because that's the Y one. Okay. Uh, there's, there's more to this term. Yeah, times, yeah. So we have this is W1, Y1. This is W2, Y2. Okay. And what's left? Minus T times T times T. Yeah. So. So we have W3, Y3. And that can be uh, simplified uh, quite a bit. Actually, wow, simplifies uh, outrageously. Um, because uh, what happens is um, you have um, you have e to the minus t times e to the t. Those cancel and make 1. You have minus t over here um, plus t over here. So this term ends up canceling with that one. And then all the exponentials cancel because e to the t here and e to the minus t's here. So your particular solution ends up being just, hold on, I'm going to segment this off. Yes, I know my board uses awful. OK. Um, so that is your particular solution, uh, t plus 2. Um, so now you can. Um, write down your general solution just by adding your homogeneous and your particular solutions together. So you have C1 plus C2 e to the t plus C3 t e to the t. Um, and um, what I can actually do is, and you might think, okay, you just go ahead and write down t plus 2 after that. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I can actually drop that. Why? We have an arbitrary, yeah, we have an arbitrary constant uh, over there. So that, that, that would cover it. Okay. But again, you know, either way, it's fine. Okay. So any questions about the, at least the finish of that? Uh, Now, um, a little time to look at undetermined coefficients. Suppose you have this also third order problem. So third derivative minus 3y double prime plus 3y prime minus y. Um, and your right hand side, your g is t squared plus 1 e to the t. Okay. 
Um, so proceed like before, like if any of these, characteristic equation. Okay, so um, how does that factor? Of the approaches I've mentioned, which one might be applicable? Yeah, this is Pascal's triangle. Um, so this is a row corresponding to uh, cubic. Um, so Pascal's triangle Idea to at least know the triangle up to up to up to this point. Uh, of course, if you know it up to this point, then you can continue it for as many rows as you need. Just by keeping in mind that each number, the interior, is the sum of the two um, above it. Um, now, because it's alternating sign, this is the factorization of r minus. The factorization of this is r minus one cubed. Um, so you have a uh, triple root. So if, it's, if not for the alternating signs, we'd have r plus 1 cubed is equal to 0. So r2 and r3 are all equal to 1. OK. Um, what is your homogeneous solution, then? Three times, so you have t up to that power minus one of t squared. Okay, um, so now we need to keep in mind the roots that we have over here um, compared to what roots would uh, lead to a solution um, of this form. We have a polynomial times uh, e to the t. So based on the same rules for. Um, uh, finding a form of a solution that's applied to second order case, just with um, some more interesting possibilities. Um, so this okay. In case anyone remembers our undetermined coefficients from before, um, what should we have here? Even if you only know one piece, that's fine. Uh, you can contribute that. Of possibilities like you have only a polynomial or all po only polynomial times exponential or times the exponential of sine or cosine. So, sorry, what? Uh, well, you uh, um, you aren't going to have an exponential. Which one? E to is it e to the at? But in this case, e to the yes. There is going to be e to the t. I'll just put it over here to make room for other stuff. Um, okay, now, if we temporarily forget about these roots, if you just keep in mind that you have this in front of the e to the t, what is this, what is this going to cause to appear? You said a naught, we need more. What? Um, well, they're not all a naught. Yes, yes. So you have a naught constant plus linear term plus quadratic term. Okay. Now, if the roots were not, if we had no roots that were equal to one in the character's equation, then this would be it. This would be the form of a particular solution. But the fact that we have these three roots equal to one, how do I have to change this? 
t cubed. t, and the exponent is the number of times that 1, um, so the root that would lead to a solution like this is 1. So the number of times it appears as a root is the power that goes here. And you know, before second order, the, the only time you can see that happen was uh, um, you know, 1 or 2 at the very most. Uh, but now anything is possible. Okay. Um, so now you have uh, three undetermined coefficients. And uh, admittedly, this gets even nastier now because uh, you, from previous problems, you're accustomed to uh, having to use a product rule on this. But now you have to go up with a third derivative. Um, so, all right, so for whatever problem arises in the final, I'll keep in mind how long it can get. Um, OK. Any questions about the getting the form of the uh, particular solution in this case? Could we have done undetermined coefficients on other problems? Um, yes, you can. Um, yeah, because, well, what are, what are the limitations? For undetermined coefficients, so you can, you can use it as long as what is true. This is a reading question from before. Um, yeah, of certain forms. Yeah, yes, and then the other condition: constant coefficients. Yeah. Okay. Now, the procedure that I gave before, the general procedure for uh, higher order equations, assumed that the coefficients were constant. If they are not constant, all you can do in that case is you would need to be given. Um, y1, y2, up to uh, yn. And so basically your homogeneous solution is handed to you, and then you would use those y1, y2, etc. you know, still computing the Ron scan to um, find the particular solution. In that case, only using variation of parameters. Yes? So would that one just be a naught? Uh, yes, it would be. Uh, wait, wait, wait. No. Almost. Um, okay, so let's take a look at that. So in this case, you'll, in fact, you can kind of tell from a particular solution we actually got t plus 2. Um, so because it's a constant uh, for your g, it's true that you're not going to have any exponential. You're not going to have any sine or cosine. It's going to be a polynomial t. But even though this polynomial is at degree zero, um, how could we end up needing degree, or what degree do you need? Keep in mind the roots that would lead to these solutions. We get a double root of one here, as you can see. But what's the other root? It's zero. So you have one root that overlaps or agrees with the root that would lead to a constant solution. So that's why is so you have um, okay. else, um, what's kind of freaky about that? So, um, so following undetermined coefficients, you would have a naught just times t. And so it's kind of weird that we wound up with t plus 2. But we also saw that that 2 turned out to be redundant. Um, so this basically gives you a minimal um, particular solution. Um, so. Um, so it's not really a contradiction that the particular solution produced using variation parameters happened to not fit the form um, of a particular solution um, done using undetermined coefficients because the extra term is in your homogeneous solution anyway. Um, but yeah, because the root that leads to this, zero, is one of the roots here, you need that t. Any other questions? OK, so um, uh, so be sure to come to me during the week if you need any help with the problem set 13 that uh, stems from this material while we get to the last part of the course, which is 
uh, Laplace transforms.